how do we live knowing we are in the end times the holy spirit through the apostle peter provides clear instructions on what a believer's end time lifestyle should be all right so we're going to make our declaration uh, at this time i want you to just please turn your bibles uh, to ephesians 6 i just want to remind us of uh, one of the many reasons why we speak the word of god so if you turn with me to uh, ephesians chapter 6 and uh, we will look at verse 17 ephesians 6 and verse 17 it's a familiar verse of scripture to many of us but just to remind us the apostle paul telling us about our armor our our weapons of defense and offense against demonic powers as part of that he says in ephesians 6 in verse 17 he says take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god take that means you and i must take it so god's not going to use it for you of course god himself he is jesus is the eternal word and i'm not uh ex- excluding that but for you and me when we wrestle or we contend against demonic powers part of what we are supposed to do is to take that means i exercise it you exercise it you take the sword of the spirit which is the word of god now how do you, what do you do with words we speak words we believe words we speak words so this is how we use the sword of the spirit you speak it you say it with your mouth the way jesus did it and that is a weapon that goes against the enemy so what we do normally is we make our declaration that means we say in a very condensed way a very concise way some of the things the bible says about us and uh, we are firm that we declare that we are speaking what god has said about us and that's a weapon against the enemy so let's rise up to our feet this morning we're going to make our declaration i want you to if you have your bibles hold it high up in the air and i want you to say this out loud bold and strong with me say it like you mean it say it like you believe it let's say this together this is god's word this is god speaking to me I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of his blessing. to many people i receive his word i believe his word and i live by his word christ is my master and to him i am in absolute surrender i present myself as a new wine skin to receive new wine and fresh oil being poured out on me god releases new things and a new work of his spirit in me and through me in Jesus name amen god bless you you may be seated please thank you for joining in that declaration this morning i want to i want us to take some time to think about and just discover or learn from scripture a few thoughts on end times lifestyle end times lifestyle in other words you know how are we to live as people who are living in the end times now many of us are aware that we are in the end times and, and as we look at things that are happening around us uh, whether it's in political in nature whether it's in the uh, in in social things that are happening or whether we are looking at uh, uh weather conditions other things the signs of the times we're we're all aware we are, we are nearing or 
closing in on the end of the end times. We are aware of that. And yet, in our efforts to live in a state of readiness for the very end, for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, how are we supposed to live? What does the Bible tell us? And it's very interesting uh, to see that in Scripture. And we will be referencing one particular passage today. Now, sadly, the church, when I say the church, I mean believers, Christians, over, over the years have misunderstood how to live in the end times, what end times lifestyle would be. And so we find people doing all kinds of silly things and sometimes even bizarre things. And you would have read about these things in the past. You know, young people say, Jesus is coming soon. I don't need to study. You know? So they drop out of college or Jesus is coming next year. I don't, why am I studying? Why do I need to go to college? You know, uh, all, all those things. And, you know, I'm guilty of that in part. <laughs> uh, after I finished my 10th, and I think my dad is watching. Uh, he will attest to this. I didn't want to study. I said, Jesus is coming soon. I, I, you know, I need to hurry up and save the world. You know, but thank God people spoke sense into me. <laughs> uh, and so you, know, you have people do those silly things. Or Jesus is coming soon, so I'm going to quit my job and, and I'm going to go evangelize the world. Or people even do bizarre things, you know, and, and you've heard of some of these things in, in the year 2000. Uh, you heard about the, those of you are old enough to know about the Y2K issue. <laughs> uh, you would have heard about that. And, uh, you know, there were different groups doing different, I'm talking about believers, Christian groups doing bizarre things. One group gathered together in Jerusalem saying Jesus is coming at the, you know, at when, the, when we turn the sanctuary. And they gathered together in Jerusalem then. They were sent out, you know. Uh, there were others who gathered on top of the hill in California. Jesus is coming. So people did, have done all kinds of bizarre things in the name of being ready for the coming of the Lord. And so I want us to you know, try and understand what does the Bible actually tell us? How do I live in a state of readiness? How do I live as a person uh, who is, understands that we are living in the end times? And so we're going to look at the writings of the Apostle Peter. Uh, and uh, Peter in his two epistles, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, uh, while he talks about uh, several different themes, one of the common themes in both his epistles is about the coming of the Lord. So Peter is addressing the coming of the Lord. Now very quickly, some background about this man Peter, which many of us may be familiar with. He was a fisherman who had a powerful encounter with Jesus, and Jesus called him. He was Andrew's brother. Andrew introduced him to Jesus. And the first meeting with Jesus, Jesus said, you are Simon, but you'll be called Peter. Meaning, I'm changing who you are. You're going to be, go from a man who was shaken by the wind, Simon meaning a reed shaken by the wind, to becoming a rock, Petros, a stable, somebody strong, solid. First encounter, your life is being changed. And Peter was the man who, who saw Jesus do amazing things. He heard all the teachings of Jesus. He saw Jesus work the miracles. He was there in the boat when, when you know, he threw that net out there and he caught this uh, you know, this, this huge catch of fish that Jesus, that, that came so miraculously. He was there on the Mount of Transfiguration when he heard this voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. He was there when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. And he was there and he saw all these miracles. He was one of the first disciples to see the empty tomb. He was there when Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appeared to the apostles. He was there when Jesus on the Mount of Olives ascended into heaven and he heard the angel say this same Jesus will come in like manner as you have seen him go so he was an eyewitness to the entirety of the ministry of Jesus Christ so when he is writing about the coming of the Lord as Peter says he was not writing some cunningly devised stories he says we were eyewitnesses to the glory 
We were there. I was there. I'm writing to you things that I've seen and heard. And so when he writes about the end times, he's writing it with an absolute confidence that that will happen because the same person who healed the sick, who calmed the waters, who did all these miraculous things that that, that showed with absolute uh, certainty that he is the Messiah, the same person said, I'm coming back again. You will see me come in the clouds of glory. So Peter is not writing religious fiction when he talks about the coming of the Lord. But there's another thing that Peter writes, and I'm just referencing here 2 Peter 3. He says, you know, in the last days, I want you to know, he's writing to the believers, he says, in the last days, scoffers will come who will say, where is the coming of the Lord? In other words, there'll be people who say, you know, we've been waiting, waiting, waiting. Where is Jesus? Where is the coming of the Lord? But then he says, in response to that, but I want you to know, 2 Peter 3 verse 8, he says, I want you to know that with the Lord, one day with the Lord is a thousand, is like a thousand years here on earth. And a thousand years here on earth is like one day to God. So you and I, when we look at time and we say 2,000 years have elapsed since the time of Jesus, where is the sign of the coming of the Lord? He says, Peter says, I want you to understand something. Time with God is so different. For him, 2,000 years is like, it's like two days. Just, just two days. Now, you and I know God lives outside of time. But Peter is just using some language for you and me to understand that time is immaterial to God. Only you and I see like, whoa, 2,000 years. And so now, if you, nowadays, if you go online, you find all kinds of articles and all kinds of people who write things that question the, the eschatology that's presented to us in the Bible. They question, no, 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 it cannot be. God is not coming. You guys are all fools. But Peter warned us. He said, you know, in the last days, there will be people like that who will say, where is the coming of the Lord? But they don't understand that time is nothing to God. Are you with me so far? So Peter has that understanding. And with that understanding, Peter writes for us how you and I should live in the end times. And this is the passage I want us to turn to, please. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. We're going to read this passage. I'm going to quickly highlight how Peter tells us with the background that we know, with which he's writing, he tells us this is how we should live as people in the end times. So 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, we're going to read these uh, five verses. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watch, watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory, be, belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Notice how Peter begins this passage in verse 7. He says, let's read it together. But the end... Of all things is at hand, therefore. He says, the end of all things is at hand. Now he's writing, this is almost 2,000 years ago, but he's writing with this understanding. That with God, time is immaterial. You and I should live in a state as though the end of all things is at hand. So believer, live like this. The end of all things is at hand. And therefore, this is how you and I should live. And this are five simple things, and that's what we want to look at this morning. Knowing that we are living in a time when the end of all things is near, how should we live? First, verse 7. He says, 
Be serious and watchful in your prayers. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. So, just kind of dig a little bit into that. Be serious. That's the, uh, the English translation. It's always good to just look at the Greek word and see what it actually means. If you look at the word be serious, he's literally meaning be of a sound mind or be clear minded. Keep your mind clear. And be watchful. That word watchful, there again, if you look it up, look it up in the Greek, it literally means don't be drunk with wine. Be watchful. In other words, it's a phrase that's used to say, be alert, morally alert, be sober, be watchful, be alert. Or we could say, be self controlled, be somebody who is self governed. So he's saying, be sound minded. Be serious, meaning be sound-minded, be clear-minded, be watchful, be sober, be always self-controlled. Why? So that you can give yourself to prayer, so that you could be prayerful. So the first thing that Peter is saying, if you and I as people living the, in, in the end times, is first thing is be prayerful. Be somebody who is always, you know, in that, uh, who is always given a prayer, with, with all prayers, we'll talk about that a little bit. But in order to be that prayerful person, there are two prerequisites. One is be clear-minded. Or if you want to put it like this, you know, if our mind is distracted and filled with all kinds of wrong things, it's actually going to rob us from being prayerful. So keep your mind clear and be a person of prayer. Pray. Now, I'm not saying don't know what's going on in the world. You need to know what's happening in the world. You know, you're aware of things. But don't fill your mind with all things that distract you and me. Especially us Christians. We are, you know, today the world is filled with all kinds. I'm, I'm talking about even the church. It's filled with all kinds of nonsense. Conspiracy theories. All kinds of things happening around the world. And believers spend hours and hours filling their mind with those kinds of things. Hey, keep your mind clear. Why? Because if you're going to be filling your mind with those kinds of things, it's going to rob you of being a prayerful person. Are you with me? Keep it simple. Keep your mind clear. Stay of a sound mind so that you can be a person of prayer. And then he says, be sober. That means don't get intoxicated. A person who's intoxicated is, is under the influence of something else. He's, he's, he's no longer there. And sometimes there are believers who are not, not there. They are so preoccupied, so intox the life is so influenced by other things that actually keep them from being watchful in prayer. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So just be clear-minded. Don't let anything so influence you that it keeps you from prayer. So first thing, well, how should we live as people in the end times? Be prayerful. All kinds of prayer. The word say, he says there, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Plural, meaning all kinds, all manner, and all forms of prayer. That means private prayer. And collective prayer. Prayer in the spirit, praying in tongues, intercession, giving up thanks, worship, all kinds of prayer. Engage in your connecting with God. Focus on that. So pray. Now, some of us will say, well, pastor, you don't know. Now that I'm under lockdown, my work hours are longer. I have no time to pray. Well, make time. Make the time. It's something you and I need to do in the times in which we live. Peter said, knowing that the end is near, therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayer. And you know, prayer connects us with God. It enables us to draw strength from God. 
It, it enables us to listen to God. And we need all of that. We need His strength. Uh, we need that intimacy with God. We need that uh, the direction from God in the times in which we live. So pray. Stay clear. Keep your mind clear. Uh, don't let anything overpower you, intoxicate you, influence you. Stay, be sober so that you can give yourself to be watchful in prayer in the times in which we live. Second thing, he says, have fervent love. This is verse 8. He says, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. So second thing, he says, have fervent love. That word fervent, again, when you look it up in the Greek, is very interesting. It has two meanings to it. Fervent, one means to be passionate, to be zealous. The other aspect of that same word, fervent, means to be abundant, enduring, never ceasing. So he says, have this kind of love for people. Have a passionate love that is enduring, that, that, that stays through time, that never ceases. So keep this heart of love towards people. Have fervent love. So how should we live in the end times? As people who have fervent love. Now why is that important? Because Jesus said, and you're familiar with this in Matthew 24 verse 12. He says, you know, in the last days, lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. That means people are going to be cold, heartless, no love. And here the Bible is telling you and me as believers, we know we are in the end times. How should we, be, how should we live with fervent love? Passionate, unending love. Just love people. Because outside in the world, things are going to get very cold. Paul writes in 2 Timothy, and I'm just referencing this in chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. He says, know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. I mean, they're going to be difficult times. Men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving. Love is absent. But for believers, he says, have fervent love. Demonstrate that. Passionate love and enduring love. And he says, because love covers a multitude of sins. And I want to just mention this here, because sometimes in the church we get this wrong. How do we balance love and truth? Sometimes we so emphasize the truth that we forget the person we're dealing with. And love is absent. Truth is important. We do not compromise truth. But truth has always to be presented with love. And in the Bible, mercy and truth are come to us through Jesus Christ. And mercy always triumphs over judgment. When truth is violated, there is judgment. But the Bible says mercy triumphs over judgment. So I think the church is so guilty of standing so firm with the truth and forgetting love. And so people don't understand the truth we speak because it's not spoken in love. There is no love in the truth we communicate. And then people cannot receive the truth. And we wonder, why aren't they understanding me? Because you're not saying it in love. Are you understanding this? So, he says, have love. Fervent love. That means passionate love. And love that's enduring. And even when we minister truth, we do it in love. It may take some time for people to get to know the truth. Be patient. It may take some time for people to come aligned to the truth. Be patient. Because love is patient. Love is kind. You don't hit people on the head and say, off you go. Because you don't line up to the truth. No. Be patient. Be kind. They will come. And what Peter highlights here is this. He says, love will cover a multitude of sins. You know, we'll get it wrong. None of us are perfect. But then when we love people, we love them in spite of the wrong. We're not condoning the wrong, but we love them. 
Because they're people. They're people for whom Jesus died. They're people whom God still loves. And he says, love covers a multitude of sins. So that's the kind of love Peter is saying we must demonstrate in the end times, in the last days. As people who know that the end is near. Number three, and I'll just quickly go through this. He says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Be hospitable to one another with a ground grumbling. Be welcoming to each other. Be friendly with strangers. And uh, if we understand the context of Peter's episode, uh, he's actually writing to believers who've been scattered, who've been dispersed because of the persecution. So these believers have been scattered throughout Asia Minor. And, uh, and many of them have, have had to abandon, you know, maybe their homes, their families, and so they are dispersed. And he's saying, you know, uh, understanding this, be hospitable. There are people there who are struggling. There are people there who may not have the possessions they had because of their faith. And, and they've, they were persecuted, so they've had to abandon things and run for their lives. So, so be hospitable, support them, love them. The second thing that's also obvious in, in, in that context are these traveling ministers, people who would travel and preach. Uh, Paul himself was one and others would travel. And so, you know, they didn't book themselves in fancy hotels those days. They just stayed in people's homes. So, uh, understanding the context, you're saying, welcome believers who, you know, who are scattered. Welcome these traveling ministers who, who, who need a place. So, be hospitable. Be welcoming to one another in these days. And so, we, you and I can extend that in whatever way we can uh, to people in need. Number four, he says, serve 1 Peter 4 and verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So he says, you know, as people who are living in the end times, take all the gifts that God has put in your life and use it to serve people. Be a good steward. In other words, don't say Jesus is coming soon, so I'm not going to do anything. No. No. Our approach should be, Jesus is coming soon. I'm going to take everything he's given me. I'm going to keep working until he comes. Amen? So take the gifts. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God, you minister to one another with the gifts that God has given you. That means get busy with whatever God's given you. Go into action. Do things to serve people. So each one here, I want to encourage you. As you have received a gift, there is something that God has blessed you with. It may be things you can use in the church. It may be things that you can use in the world. You may be, you know, a good in business. You may be a professional. Uh, whatever kind of work you're doing, Peter is saying, you know, whatever you received it, you use it to serve and be a good steward of the grace of God on your life. So notice he's not telling us, go to sleep. He's not telling us, Abdicate all responsibility and disappear. No. He's saying get active. Get involved. Serve. Be a good steward of whatever God has put in your hands. You know it's the end time, but use what you've given. You've been given. Are you with me so far? And lastly, number five. First Peter, verse 11. Chapter 4, verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and dominion forever and ever. So he says, whatever you do, if you're a person who's speaking, if you're a person who's serving, whatever each one of us is doing, how should we do it? Do it all to the glory of God. So how do you, how do you and I live in the end times? We live in such a way that we say, God, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it to glorify you. That means I want to point people to you. Let my life point people to you. Whatever I do, I'm doing it to the glory of God. Whether you're speaking, you're ministering, whatever, it's, it's not necessarily a complete list. But whatever gift you're doing, whatever you're expressing, do it in order to glorify God. So if you are, you know, you're working in an IT company and you're writing code, do it to the glory of God. You're in a sales area and you're doing, you're selling something, do it to the glory of God, that God may be glorified through your 
life. Whatever you're doing, do it to the glory of God. Amen? Now it's very simple. He says, this is how you and I must live in the end times. It's very interesting. He doesn't find, you don't find anything that says, leave everything. Assemble on Mount Olives immediately. You don't find those kinds of instructions. The instructions are very simple. Knowing that we are living in the end times, I'm just going to review. How should we live? Number one, it says be serious, watchful in your prayers. Be prayerful. Give time to pray. Time to be with God. Take the time. All of us can. Clear your mind up. Don't let, anything, don't let anything else intoxicate you, meaning overpower you, dominate you. Be alert. Be watchful in prayer. Next Sunday, I'm going to expand on this. I'm going to explain. I want us to understand what it means to, be, to watch and pray, to be watchful in prayer. So we'll expand on that next Sunday. Number two, it says have fervent love for one another. Have love that is passionate, that is zealous, and that's enduring. Because the world is not going to have it in the end days, in the end times. So you and I as believers demonstrate that love. Thirdly, it says be hospitable to one another with a grumbling. Extend hospitality and share, give, bless. Do what you can to let people know you care for them. Number four, he says, exercise your gifts and grace. Use what God's given you. Bless people with the gifts and the grace God's given you. Be active in that. Don't become passive. Yeah, we know Jesus is coming soon. But use your gifts to serve people. So we're going to talk, number four, the following Sunday. We'll talk about how to be good stewards of the gift, gifts, grace, and ministry for each of us. So we'll expand on that in the following Sunday, Sunday after next. And number five, he says, do all things to glorify God. That should be our sole motivation while we are living on earth. What do you want to see happen in your life? One thing, I want to see God glorified through my life. Amen? What do you want to see happen through your life? One thing, I want to see God glorified. Through my life. Whatever I do, I want God to be glorified. It's not about my name. It's not about my reputation. It's not about how much money I make or what I can, you know, how, how successful I can be. I mean, all those things are okay. They're good. They're secondary, perhaps even immaterial. But there's one thing that should motivate all of us. We want God to be glorified through our lives. That's how we live in the end times. Amen? Those of you who are awake can say amen. Why don't we stand up to our feet? Worship team, please come. So, just want to read that whole passage again. 1 Peter 4, 7 to 11 before we pray. If you can have it up back on the screen. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. I'll read that again for us. Peter said, but the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. We are there. Therefore, live like this. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. Take time to pray. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Love people. Love them passionately and love them with an enduring love. Unceasing love is what Peter says. Be hospitable. Show people that you care. Welcome them into your world. Be hospitable. Verse 10. As you receive a gift, minister to one another. Serve people. Be a good steward of the multifaceted grace of God. So God's grace is not just one shaped, it's multifaceted. So it's different. 
But he says, be a good steward of what God's put in your life. And then verse 11, he says, you know, whatever we do, each one of us, whether we are speaking, whether we are serving, do it with the ability God has given you. God has given you ability. Do it with that. But do it that in all things God may be glorified. God, I want you to be glorified. It's not about my name, my position, none of that. I want God to be glorified through my life. And that's why we do it. So this is simple enough for all of us to practice. And he says, that's all it takes to live in the end times. This is end times lifestyle. Nothing complicated. Nothing sophisticated. Just simple. Live like this. And you will always be ready for the coming of the Lord. Amen. This morning, as we respond to the words, I want you to pray about one of these five things. If you want to pray about all five, go ahead. But at least one of these five things and say, Lord, I want to practice that in my life. Help me to do it. I don't know which one of these five you may feel I need to put that into my life. Maybe being watchful in prayer. Pray and say, Lord, help me to do that. Maybe I need to love people fervently. I need to love them when it's difficult. I need to love them when I'm pushed to the end. I still need to love. Third, help me to be welcoming to people. More welcoming. Fourth, maybe I need to be a good steward of the gift and the grace and the ministry that God has given each one of us. Maybe you need to pray about that. Say, God, help me to do it. And lastly, God, I want you to be glorified in my life. Let's take some time to pray. Say, so this is how we live in the end times. Maintain this kind of a life. Everybody, let's just pray. Take this time.
take a moment just to pray and we're going to pray collectively for people if you have lost a job during this time this this period that we've been under lockdown if you lost a job and you're in that place where you say God I need I need a job I need you to intervene in my life we want to pray together as a body for those people that God would intervene God would move and we know that things are difficult things around us economically but yet God is a miracle working God God can still move in our circumstances and situations so we're just going to pray there might be people who are in this auditorium there might be those of you who are watching online and uh, the means for you to receive your income so when I say a job I mean the means by which you receive your income for some of us it's a job for some of us it's a business for some of us it could be some other ways in which you know, your, 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 your income, you get your money. But if that's been stopped, 
we want to pray that God will move on your behalf and bring provision into your life. Maybe it might be getting a job, it might be getting more business in, business in, whatever it is. We're going to pray. I want all of us to pray towards that end. I don't want to embarrass anybody and ask you to lift your hand. That's, that's not the point. The point is God wants to do that for you. Right where you are, you say, Father, I'm here and I need this to be done in my life. And really, this is part of his covenant to you and me. You say, what do you mean it's part of his covenant? If you look in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 8 and verse 18, it says, Remember the Lord your God because it is he who gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant with you it's there in the Bible that God said he will give you the power to get wealth and which to make your money to have your income as part of his covenant with you it's part of his covenant if it was in the old then it isn't the new because the new is better than the old. And so we want to pray. I want you to ask God with confidence, Lord, I know my job may have gone, whatever may have happened, but I'm standing before you in this place this morning. For those of you watching online, I'm standing before you based on that word that you will give me the power to get wealth. And all of us, let's pray and bless the church community and say, God, we bless people who might be standing here in this auditorium or might be watching online who need a job who need a source of income however that is however it means whatever it means in their life but they need it so god provide according to your covenant let's all pray father as a church community we pray for our brothers and sisters god our our own people god there might be those standing in this auditorium today who may not have a job or may not have a source of income for them a source of supply coming in or they might be those who are watching online in their homes maybe they haven't had a job for four months now but father we remind you of your word which says remember the lord your god because it is he who gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant with you so we pray you will provide them a means oh God whether it's another job or a a reviving of their business or whatever work they may be engaged in Lord we pray you will release your supply into their lives today by the power of your Holy Spirit let that word be established in their lives and let there be testimonies let there be people saying I agreed in prayer that day and a miracle took place God intervenes Father do this because of your promise because we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for doing it, Father. We bless you. We honor you. We thank you for your goodness in the lives of your people. That you cause them to experience your supply even in famine. You cause them to experience your abundance even in times of shortage. Thank you for doing that in the lives of your people. Thank you, Father. We bless your people. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close. I'm going to just speak the blessing of God over us as a people. Now, just some instructions. For those of you who are watching online, right after this, part of our pastoral team will is on the cloud. 
they'll be on Zoom. So you could go there. Our past, part of our pastoral team are available there. They will pray for you. They'll minister to you online. Those of you who are watching from home or wherever. And those of you who need prayer or want to come and be prayed for here in the auditorium, uh, I'll be here. Pastor Jacob will be here. Uh, we just request it to be done in an orderly way so that there's no crowd. Uh, you could just come. Uh, keep distance between yourselves. Uh, please come. We would be happy to pray with you. And then you can exit uh, through the door, right? We just want to do it in a very orderly way so that nobody is compromised anyway. So after we do the benediction, you can dismiss. You can exit through any of the exits. Just a reminder, please take the plastic cups and put it out into one of those recycled bins that we have outside. And uh, for those of you who want to be ministered to personally, we'll be available here. Uh, we just request that you would be mindful of other people who might be coming for prayer. Uh, and this will just be happy to serve you that way. All right. So let's just close with the benediction. And thank you once again, each of you, for being with us this morning. Thank you. We appreciate you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.